Question number one. What is the theological anthropology that underlies the idea of godliness in the body? Thank you. Some years ago, before there was BBC Sounds and they, used to, and they put radio programmes in series, there was a Radio 4 series called uh, on, on the Seven Deadly Sins, and the title of it was And Next Week Lust. <laughs> the point was you couldn't load them all at once, so they wanted you to keep listening. <laughs> and everybody wanted the one on lust, so they went for that. And similarly, from Mark's introduction and from what people are saying, what they're interested in is get to the good stuff, Martin, talk about Church of England's attitude towards sexuality. But you can't get to the good stuff until you've worked your way to it and placed it in context of a Christian worldview. And so we'll start off by saying, what's the theological anthropology? Now, a key text for thinking about the issue of godliness in the body is Paul's injunction to the Christians in, one, in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 6.20, glorify God in your body. Now, what's not generally noticed about this injunction, as you can see if you look at the commentaries, is the implicit anthropology that underlies it. This anthropology tells us about two things, how we exist as human beings and the purpose of our existence as human beings, what philosophers call ontology and teleology. To put it another way, this anthropology tells us both who we are and what we are here for. Who we are as human beings, if we take the first point first, 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us implicitly that as human beings we are creatures with bodies. There would be no point in the Corinthians being told to glorify God in their body if, in fact, they had no bodies in which they could do so. It would make about as much sense as telling someone with no legs that they should walk. What this verse also implicitly tells us, however, is that as human beings we are not just bodies. Paul does not write to the Corinthians, bodies glorify God. What he writes is glorify God in your bodies, a command that only makes sense if there is a self, a you, that possesses a body but is not identical with it. This self is clearly not a material entity because if it was, it would then be a body, whereas Paul distinguished it from the body. It must therefore be an incorporeal or spiritual entity. And in order for Paul's injunction to make sense, it must also be an entity that is capable of hearing, assuming that Paul's letters were originally read aloud, understanding and then acting on the basis of that understanding. It follows that what we're talking about is a conscious, rational, spiritual entity that is capable of directing the body. What Christian theology and Western philosophy has traditionally called a soul. In summary, what we learn from thinking about what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6.20 is that what has been taught down by the centuries by the Christian tradition, namely that human beings are what is known as a psychosomatic unity of a material body and an immaterial soul. Now, this anthropology is based on what the Bible teaches in passages such as 1 Corinthians 6 and on the insights of the Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle. It was taught by the early church fathers and by the theologians in the Middle Ages, and it continued to be taught by the mainstream Protestant theologians during the Reformation. Martin Luther, for example, in his small catechism of 1529, explains that the creedal statement, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, means I believe as God, that God has created me and all that exists, and that he has given me and still sustains my body and soul. And the Anglican tradition agrees. We see this, for example, in the words of the Holy Communion service in the Book of Common Prayer. The minister gives the people the bread and wine, so that Christ's body and blood may preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. The people offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, and pray that through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and in soul. Likewise, in the BCP burial service, a distinction is made between the soul of the departed, which it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself, and their body, which is committed to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So, who am I? Paul, in the Christian tradition following Paul, says that I'm a single self, a psychosomatic unity consisting of a body and a soul. I am a material body, including a material brain. But that is not all I am. I am also an immaterial, conscious, rational soul that is aware of God, other people in the world in general, 
and that acts in and through my body in the light of this awareness. Now, as Nancy Pearcey notes in her book, Love Thy Body, there is a tendency in modern Western thought to regard the soul, the conscious part of our existence, as the quote-unquote authentic self, with the body demoted to nothing but a meat skeleton, extraneous to who we are. As we shall see later, this has a big impact on how you think about sexuality. But this is not the Christian view. The Christian view is that while I am not simply my body, nevertheless I am my body and my body is me. As when I say, I am going to sit down, or I fell off my bicycle. Both are acts directly involving only my body, but nonetheless involving me as a whole. Now one day my material body will die unless Jesus returns first, but my soul will survive that death, and because disembodiment is not its proper state, God will reunite my soul with my resurrected body in the general resurrection of the dead at the end of time. And although there are reports of out-of-body experiences, for the most part, everything that we do as human beings takes place through the soul and body acting together. For example, these words you are hearing this evening exist because the soul, aware of these words through a properly functioning body, my brain was working okay when I wrote them, instructed a body to type them on a computer using a brain, a hand and an arm to do so. Now, the fact that human beings have souls as well as material bodies is what enables them to act in a moral fashion. What is to act morally? To act morally is to freely choose to do something in response to a sense of moral obligation. In the case of purely material entities, there is no element of choice. So if I was to take this pen and hurl it at Lee Gates' head, the pen would have no choice of not or whether it would hit him or not. If the physical forces impelling it to move means that it will hit that person, then it will hit them. We need to chest that just a <laughs> No, I've only got one pen. <laughs> if we hold that a human being is a purely material entity, the same point would universally apply. We would then have to take a determinist view of human activity and say that all our thoughts and intentions and the acts that flow from them are controlled by physical forces in a way not chosen by us, and that we are therefore have no freedom of the will and consequently no more freedom of our actions than a a flung stone or a flung pen has. If determinism was true, it would be difficult to make sense of moral obligation and responsibility. Now, as James Morland notes, if I ought to do something, for instance, glorify God in my body, it seems to be necessary to suppose that I can do it, that I could have done otherwise, and that I'm in control of my actions. No one would say that I ought to jump to the top of a 50-foot building and save a baby, or that I ought to stop the American Civil War in the present year because I do not have the ability to do either. Since human morality, presupposing freedom to choose and act on what we choose, does exist, the only reasonable explanation is that, as Christian tradition has affirmed, human beings do have souls as well as material bodies. Furthermore, the existence of both parts of human nature, bodies and souls, points in their own way to the existence of the God who created them. They tell us that a truthful anthropology needs to be a theological anthropology, an anthropology that understands human existence in relation to God. In the case of our bodies, the intricate design of our bodies, like the intricate design of the material world as a whole, points to the existence of God as their designer and creator. As the American writer Stephen Mayer puts it in his recent book, The Return of the God Hypothesis, not only does theism solve a lot of philosophical problems, But empirical evidence from the material world points powerfully to the reality of a great mind behind the universe. Our beautifully expanding and finely tuned universe and the exquisite integrated and informational complexity of living organisms (coughs) bears witness to the reality of a transcendent intelligence, a personal God. So to echo the words of the 18th century Anglican apologist William Paley, just as the existence of a watch requires the existence of a watchmaker, So the existence of a physical universe, our bodies included, point to the existence of the God who designed them and called them into being. Psalm 139 is clearly right. Furthermore, the existence of God as the transcendent immaterial intelligence behind the physical universe is also required in order to explain the existence of our souls. As C.S. Lewis notes in his book on miracles, it does not make sense to say that the conscious rational minds are product of an irrational material universe, what Lewis calls nature. 
Rather, they must be supernatural entities originating in a supernatural, rational mind outside of nature. And this is what the Christian tradition calls God. Human minds, then, are not the only supernatural entities that exist, right, Lewis. They do not come from nowhere. Each has come into nature from supernature. Each has its taproot in an eternal, self-existent, rational being whom we call God. Each is an offshoot or spearhead or incursion of that supernatural reality into nature. We can thus say both that morality requires the existence of souls and the existence of souls in turn requires the existence of God as their creator. In summary, reflection on Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 6.20 shows us that to be human is to exist as a being who consists of both body and soul and who has been called into existence by God. And that brings us to the next question, what are we here for? If we turn to the question of the purpose of our existence as human beings, Paul's injunction in 1 Corinthians 6.20 points us to the truth that our purpose as conscious rational beings is to use our bodies as means or instruments through which the God who created us is glorified. In the well-known words of the Westminster Short Catechism, the chief end of man is to glorify God. And this end is achieved by human souls working through human bodies. Now the Hebrew word kavov translated as doxa in Greek and in English as glory, in English, has the root meaning of heaviness. And by extension, can to be used to describe the weight and hence the worthiness of something or someone. So it's heaviness, weight, worthiness. Used with reference to God, the term means the intrinsic worthiness of the one true creator God because of his being and his activity. God is glorious because his being and activity are of supreme worth, better than anything else that exists or could ever exist. To glorify God is to declare this fact by bearing witness to who God is and what he has done through our words and deeds, and to do this involves our souls and bodies acting together. Now if we turn back to the creation narratives in Genesis 1, we find that human beings are created by God as the climax of his creative activity, and that they are created by God in his image and likeness. Then God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. If we think about it for a moment, we will see that the term image necessarily involves the idea of someone or something being revealed or made known. To say something is an image means that it points to some reality beyond itself and makes that reality manifest in some way. Thus, when I see a photograph of my new granddaughter, I see an image of her. Something that is not Sarah, but nevertheless shows me what she's like. In similar fashion, when Genesis 1 says that human beings are made in God's image, the point that is being made is that God has created human beings to make known what he's like. In fact, as Henri Blanchet has pointed out, the Hebrew preposition ve, used in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, would be better translated by the word as rather than the word in. God created human beings as his image and as his likeness in order to reveal his being and hence his glory in the world that he's just made. Now, if we ask how human beings are to perform this function, the answer that Genesis gives us is that they are to do it by ruling over the world on his behalf. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Genesis 1.26 God is the world's true king, and human beings are called to reflect his kingship by ruling the world on his behalf. And furthermore, doing this involves human souls and bodies acting together. We can see this in Genesis 2, for example, where Adam is placed in the Garden of Eden with the charge to till and keep it. As anyone who's ever done gardening will know, tilling and keeping is an activity of the body. But it's an activity of the body that is also an activity of the soul. It's the conscious, rational self working through the body that gets the job done. And we can also see the same idea in the various other injunctions in the Bible in which God's people are instructed to fulfil the end for which human beings were created through glorifying God by acting in ways that will make him known. For example, in Exodus 19.6, the commission given by God to the people of Israel is that you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's the basic calling of Israel. And as Chris Wright and others have noted, this is a missionary calling. What it means is that Israel is called to fulfil the promise of the blessing of the nations given to Abraham in Genesis 12.3. 
by being the means by which the nations scattered after Babel come to know and worship the one true God. Just as priests in Israel were called to make God known to the people of Israel and to bring the people of Israel before God in worship, so Israel as a whole is called to do the same for the world as a whole. And Exodus 19.5 tells us that this will take place if Israel obeys God's voice and keeps his covenant, which in turn means living in obedience to the laws given to Israel by God through Moses. Laws which can only be fulfilled by the people of Israel acting rightly through their bodies, as, for instance, the study of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 makes clear. All the Ten Commandments involve doing things or not doing things through our bodies. And the same is true of all the other laws given to Israel as well. As you see that if you work through the Pentateuch. For a second example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ says in some well-known words in Matthew 5, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bush to put on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light shine, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, as Peter Lightheart notes in his commentary on Matthew, in these words, the world, in these words, the world is conceived as a temple, and we are the lampstand of the temple. Just as there was a menorah, a lampstand in the temple in Jerusalem, so we are the lampstand in the temple, shining to light up the whole house. The image of light merges into the image of a city, a lighted city raised up to bring the nations to glorify the Father. Jerusalem was supposed to be that city, see Isaiah 2, 1 to 4. Jesus says that the disciples will take over that ancient Israelite role. The city that is going to be raised up as the chief city is not Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem. The Jerusalem above, the Jerusalem that is the church. And here again we see that human beings are called to make God known. The function of light is to make it possible for things to be seen, and the calling of God's people under the new covenant as under the old is to enable the nations of the world to know and to glorify God. How are they to do this? Through the performance of good works. Actions performed in obedience to God that reveal the truth about God and how he wants his human creatures to live. And because of the way human beings are made, such works are necessarily bodily works, actions performed by conscious, rational human souls through the bodies to which they are united. For example, turning the other cheek and giving someone your cloak, Matthew 5, 39 to 40, are actions of the soul through the body and so with everything else that Christ asks us to do in the Gospels. So, to summarise, what follows from all this is that Paul's injunction to the Corinthians to glorify God in your body is not an idiosyncratic demand. Rather, it's a summary of the vocation given by God to his human creatures throughout the whole of Scripture. Godliness in the body is what we're all called to undertake. <laughs>